Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they worked so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. More information is at FarmBureauAdvantage.com. The Remarkable Soybean. From its oil, we get products like ink, candles, and paint. From its meal, we get a high-protein fiber used in foods and animal feeds. Natural soy is replacing chemicals and products you use every day. You can learn more about soybeans at VASoybean.com. Handcrafted and local beverages are all the rage in 2018, and some of those beverages are having an impact on Virginia agriculture. This week we visit the community of Whitehall, Virginia to learn about kombucha. Pretty cool stuff. We also have a story on harvesting ginseng. Those stories and more on this episode of Virginia Farming. I'm Jeff Ishi. Virginia farmers are hard at work bringing in the 2018 crop of soybeans. The latest estimate from the U.S. Department of Agriculture indicates that we should see a yield of about 43 bushels per acre this fall, which is one bushel below what farmers saw in 2017. Total production of soybeans in Virginia this year is estimated at 26 million bushels from 610,000 acres. Now, of course, prices for beans They've been all over the board this year due to trade negotiations and other factors. But overall, it looks like a, a pretty good crop of beans coming off the field this fall. Virginia cattlemen and others have been producing a lot of quality beef in recent years. In fact, the percentage of beef graded as prime, it's doubled in just the past eight years. Bob Severa has the story from the American Angus Association. The wide choice select spread says markets and ultimately consumers are hungry for more of the best beef. But according to other spreads, aiming for simply more choice might be aiming too low. What I think is, is, is maybe just as important or more important is looking at the premium choice or CAB to choice spread and the prime to choice spreads. Uh, those spreads have continued to grow and to be very, very significant in light of the fact that we've produced an awful lot more uh, pounds in the marketplace. So that tells me the demand is really, really strong for high quality beef. Some people might worry that we can't keep producing better and better beef. Is that goal sustainable? When we look at the production efficiencies around quality, around marbling and spe specifically, we don't have to give things up. We don't have to give up feedlot performance. We don't have to give up uh, uh, average daily gain and feed efficiency. We don't have to give up maternal function and fertility in our cow herd. So I want to say it's a free lunch, uh, but it's, it's maybe as close to a free lunch out there as, as, as what, we've, what we've found. We can select for more high marbling cattle, higher quality grades, ultimately a better product without sacrificing production. So when we can grow demand without increasing our costs, I think that's a pretty sustainable model. Along with all the signs that look good for the long term, McCulley says the near term holds more flexible options for the people who feed cattle that can hit high quality beef targets. I think cattle feeders understand today when they feed these cattle that have a high marbling potential, uh, it's almost a, another risk management strategy for them. And by that, it, it meaning they, they have the ability to, to possibly shorten the days on feed on those cattle if the market situation uh, suggests they should. They can take advantage of maybe some seasonal highs in the choice select spread and maybe get in front of marking those cattle a little bit early to take advantage of that. And those cattle with high marbling potential have the ability um, uh, with those fewer days on feed to go ahead and hit those premiums, be choice, be premium choice, be prime. And, uh, and that's a real benefit uh, uh, to, to the cattle feeder. McCulley also says that's a real benefit for everyone from the pasture gate to the dinner plate. I'm Bob Cervera. Thank you, Bob, for that report. Well, farmers and others in our region are still recovering from the effects of Hurricane Florence back in September. The USDA wants agricultural producers to know that there are, well, there's numerous resources available to them to recover from natural disasters. The USDA's new website, farmers.gov, it has updated tools and information to help agricultural producers identify the right programs and make decisions for their operations. Bottom line, 
help for farmers is available at the website farmers.gov. Well, the Virginia Ag in the Classroom program continues to benefit both teachers and school children. Kids are learning more about where their food comes from and how it's grown, while teachers have access to readily available lesson plans on horticulture, forestry, and of course agriculture. Officials say Ag in the Classroom has served almost 17,000 teachers and half a million students since the program began. The Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services is encouraging people to know the law before they head to the woods this fall to harvest ginseng. The season for harvesting wild ginseng started on September the 1st and it runs through the end of the year. This valuable plant is a, it's a threatened species in Virginia and digging it is prohibited on most public lands, including state and national forest and parks. Questions about ginseng can be answered by calling your local office of Virginia Cooperative Extension. Well, this week, Amy visits the community of Whitehall, Virginia, to learn about a healthy and popular beverage. That's our focus on Ag Insights, coming up next. Today we're in Whitehall, Virginia, and we're visiting Mountain Culture Kombucha, and I'm joined by owner Peter Roderick. Peter, thank you so much for having us out today. Thank you, Amy, for coming. So explain to me a little bit, what is kombucha? So kombucha is, the short answer is that it's a fermented tea. Really what it is, it's a very similar process to making beer. However, instead of alcohol being the end result, it's probiotics. So we start with green tea. You could use green, black, oolong tea, any kind of actual tea leaves. And then we use organic evaporated cane juice for our fermentable sugar. So what we do is we brew a tea as if, it's just like you were brewing a cup of tea at home, only a lot bigger and then we add our sugar to it. And then what we do is we add our live culture of kombucha into these tanks where we do our main fermenting here. And then they're fermented out. And from there, we add, we pump them up the hill into the trailer where you saw earlier with the bright tanks. So that's where we add flavors and make them cold. And the big thing about making them cold is since it's naturally effervescent, in order to get it into this bottle, it really has to be cold. Otherwise it just bubbles everywhere. So, and you don't really get much liquid in the bottle, it's just all foam. Yeah, it just be all foam. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so that's basically what kombucha is, is fermented tea that results in a lot of probiotics. And it also, it, you get organic acids, that's kind of where the tart taste comes from. So okay. So that's all part of it. So how did you come to the decision where, okay, you know what, we're going to start brewing kombucha. How did that all come about? So I guess it probably really all started over a decade ago. My mom, when I was probably about 11, handed me a bottle of kombucha and said, you're drinking this whether or not you like it, and just because it's good for you. So, you know, I definitely remember the first sip was like, wow, that's weird. Do I like that? And, you know, fast forward a few years later and I was, you know, out on my own and drinking it all the time and just trying all the different brands I could find. There weren't that many back then. And eventually just started, you know, I got so into drinking it, enjoying it, and the way it made me feel that I wanted to make it myself, and finally found someone that had a culture that I could get my hands on to actually start producing it, and it took about six to eight months of <laughs> trial and error, and a lot, mostly error, to finally start getting something that I wanted to drink, and then that sort of turned into just making it for myself for a long time, and Eventually, you know, I would share it with friends and family and they'd ask if they could, you know, take some bottles home or something and so that sort of snowballed into doing 10 and 20 gallon batches on a really small scale, sort of delivering them to a few people, pretty much like the milkman used to be where I had returnable bottles and okay. people would pay like on a monthly basis and then that sort of just snowballed to the point where me and Kelsey were sitting down one day and we were just like, you know, we should probably turn this into a real business, or at least try. Okay, and Kelsey's your partner. Yep. And when did you guys start Mountain Culture? We started in, we started working on figuring out what we would, I mean, it took forever just to even figure out what was required of, from the health department, the Department of Agriculture and everything else. We started that process in the spring of 2012, and we were finally got to the point where we had done all that and gotten our permits and everything else, and we were able to start selling at the Charlottesville Farmer's Market in the fall of 2012, September. 
right when we started off. Okay. So then what happened? At the farmer's market, it, did it, it just took off? Yeah, it was pretty crazy. We, when we first started off, we were, you know, we were brewing about 40 gallons per week, and we were really worried if we were going to be able to sell it all. And then we went to the farmer's market the first time, and we were completely sold out two hours before the end of the market, and had wow. already and had been approached by four different buyers from local grocery stores who were like, I want this yesterday, I mean, right now. So we just kind of started figuring out how to get it to them and make more slowly, slowly but surely. Now, is this, does this come from an old Appalachian culture? It certainly has been a tradition in Appalachia for, I've, I've actually traced back people that have been brewing with the culture we had back into the 50s in Rappahannock County, but kombucha itself is much older than that. The oldest recorded history is about 3,000 years in the Himalayas. Wow. So, and there's a lot of, there's a, certainly a bunch of different folk stories about how it started. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the one that... Well, over 3,000 years, yeah. you can imagine how that story grows. <laughs> yeah. So there's ones where the some emperor was sick and then this doctor brought him this weird fermented tea and the doctor's name was Kambu and Cha is the name for tea. That's one story. There's also the one where... You know, the warriors went out on the hunt or whatever, and their wives at home had made tea, and they were gone longer than they thought, and the tea set out for longer and then turned into something else. And so, Okay. But no wow. one really knows. <laughs> but you're making it today, and it sounds like you're very prolific with this company. Yeah, we've, we went from starting with just the Farmersville Farmers Market, Charlottesville Farmers Market, ended up in four retail stores the very next week and now just over two years later we're in 60 locations throughout Virginia including Whole Foods and up in DC and Virginia Beach and Richmond and stuff. And wow. Now kombucha is supposed to have some really good health benefits. Yeah. What are some of those that it's known for? Yeah kombucha has been known for, I mean if you look it up on the internet there's literally a staggering array of things from digestion to liver cleansing to hair to skin qualities. Um, for me personally I just notice I feel better when I drink it more often. You know, I definitely will say, from per, I can say from personal experience that my digestion is much happier when I drink it often and I just have sort of overall more energy and stuff like that. I mean, it's really, when people ask me about the health benefits of kombucha, I really say it's best to just try it, you know, drink, maybe replace your soda or something like that for just a month and see what it does for you because mm -hmm. everybody's different. I want to talk a little bit about the process. How do you get, you start with tea leaves, walk us through the process and how you get to the bottle that you're holding. Yeah. <clears throat> so literally we start with, um, we use all green tea for our kombucha and we start with whole tea leaves. We use only organic and fair trade tea. So we steep those leaves in hot water just like you would making a cup of tea at home. And then from there we add organic evaporated cane juice which is essentially cane sugar from fair trade and that is then boiled into the tea mixture and then we cha you know we adjust the temperature to what we want for the fermentation and then we pump it into these fermenters here and then from there we add our starter that's grown in that other tank there into it so then that's basically it's the same idea as when a brewer pitches yeast into something to make beer it's putting the, the active living culture into it to okay. start the fermentation so that goes through a, what we call the primary ferment and that's you know anywhere from seven to ten days and from there, it's put into the bright tanks up in the, the walk-in up, up in the driveway. And that's where we also add flavors to it from there. So we want to add the flavors when it's cold to really preserve the freshness of those that we're using. Okay. And that from there, they sit in there for about another week to really just infuse everything, make sure the flavors are blended. And we pump them down here to this bottling machine and fill them four at a time. By hand. <laughs> By hand. See? Everything by hand. Um, and it's a family business. Yeah. Everybody pitches in, doesn't it? Yep, absolutely. That's amazing. Now, you mentioned adding flavors to it. How many varieties of kombucha so, do you make? So we have eight different flavors. Um, there's the original, which is no flavor. That's literally just the kombucha itself, the tea, and then the tartness it develops, and the bubbliness, a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of tart. Um, and then we have a few relatively simple flavors, like the fresh mint, where it's literally just mint leaves that are infused into that same kombucha 
and that extracts the oils out of the mints. We have um, a hops flavor, which is, hops are the same flour that are used in beer. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you can use them for a lot of different things and get a lot of different flavors out of it. And that's sort of the same idea where it's just literally infusing the herb fresh whole right into the kombucha. And then we have ones like this, the ginger. Um, this is literally, we take whole ginger root and we use that uh, press machine over there to turn that into juice and then those are put into the kombucha as well. Mm -hmm. So then that's also why, I mean, we do that with, um, the ginger has the pressed juice, the Appalachian harvest has carrot, apple, and ginger. Um, the mango is a puree, and then that also has chili peppers that we steep and then add to Ooh. it. Um, and so a there's a lot, savory there's a ton of different, one. yeah, and a little bit of yeah, sweet and spicy, that's a okay. really good one. Um, we also even, we have the Sumatra Sunrise, which is a really unique kombucha because it's coffee, honey, and mint, which, Coffee really? and honey are not things you find in kombucha no. very often. Wow. Um, so that's, and that's made with locally roasted Sumatra from Shindo Joe. Do you have a bestseller? The ginger, the one I'm holding in the my ginger? hand. The ginger, okay. Um, which would be followed closely by the blueberry lemongrass. Ever since we introduced that this past summer, that's just been, it's, it's kind of neck and neck with the ginger. Right. So it's sort of, they're, they're, they're pretty, sort of different spectrums. You know, the ginger is really spicy and strong flavor, and the blueberry's got that kind of nice fruitiness and mellow, like, lemony flavor. Okay. So. Explain to me a little bit about how the actual fermentation process works. Because in beer, they're trying to build yeast. But in kombucha, you're trying to break it down? Um, well, not exactly. We, we, we are trying to grow the yeast as well, but it's basically, so the kombucha culture is called a SCOBY, which is an acronym for Symbiotic Community of Bacteria and Yeast. So it's symbiotic because what's happening within the ferment is the yeasts are going after like the glucose and the sucrose in the sugars, and, or the, mostly the sucrose, I misspoke, and then they are turning that sucrose into alcohol and carbonation. The bacteria is at the same time are going after that alcohol that the yeast are producing, and that's what they are eating. So that's how the bacteria proliferate themselves, is by eating the alcohol that the yeast produce, which is also how, with the right conditions, you can have a non-alcoholic product rather than something with a higher percentage. Right. So now you've got a non-alcoholic product that is full of probiotics. Yep, exactly. Which everyone has heard are... <laughs> Super for everything. Yeah. <laughs> Super for everything. Happy gut, happy life. Peter, where can we find Mountain Culture Kombucha? And do you have a website? Yeah, um, so our website is mountainculturekombucha.com. We also have social media that you can find, both Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under that same name. And then retail locations we have in Charlottesville, Waynesboro, Stanton, Harrisonburg, Richmond, Virginia Beach, and Washington, D.C. We're in all the Whole Foods that are in those locations, as well as Rebecca's and IY and you know health, local health food stores like that in Charlottesville, Market Street Market. Um, we're in some restaurants like Blue Moon Diner, Revolutionary Soups, um, over in Harrisonburg and the Friendly City Food Co-op, Elwood Thompson's in Richmond. Um, and then you know there's some coffee shops and other sandwich shops and stuff thrown in there as well. And all of that from showing up to the Charlottesville <laughs> Farmer's Market and saying, let's see if people like this. Yep. Amazing. It's been quite a journey. Well, thanks for having us. I'm going to try a blueberry lemongrass with you here. Please and do. And I appreciate you having us out today. Absolutely. The autumn season is progressing quickly, and many gardeners are already making notes for their Christmas wish list for 2018. Almost all gardeners appreciate new tools, as we learn in this segment of from the ground up with Chris Mullins. Well, hello, welcome to Virginia State's uh, Randolph Farm today. We're, we're here talking about tools. You know, a gardener loves their tools and a good tool can really help make a great gardener. And this time of the year, as you're thinking about gifts maybe for people during the holidays, I think tools can be a, a really nice present. Uh, today we're here with Charles House. Charles is with waycooltools.com. Is that right? That's right. And I got your catalog here. Really nice selection of things in here. Um, and so you all do mostly specialty type tools, interesting tools. And I see a couple here, pretty interesting things, kind of a um, pick type tool, right? That's right, this is, this is a, a mini pick. It's, it's got some weight to it, uh, and that weight works to your advantage. Uh, it's, it's a great tool for chopping, for breaking through roots, for breaking up heavy soil, and uh, 
planting. It's got a good, uh, a good pick that's r just a really great all-round tool, even for dealing with rock gardens and things sure. like that. Yeah. And this is its, its uh, baby sister, the, the, mini, the, the featherweight mini pick. It's really a lightweight oh, tool. Wow. Uh, a lot of ladies like this. Yeah. It's a great tool for container gardening, uh, for, for planting, for putting, uh, for putting in uh, your container plants. Uh, it's, a, it's an all-round great tool and can be used for a lot of the same things that the mini pick is used for, for, for chopping and cutting and digging in that regard. I like these. What are some other stocking stuffers you might have? Well, stocking stuffers, uh, uh, one stocking stuffer is the famed Leche digging tool. It, it's got a great, greater amount of leverage because of the offset design. And it's got uh, serrated teeth for cutting through roots. It's a great tool for digging out dandelion roots for using as a planting tool. This is a really great tool. It's, uh, it's been featured in the Wall Street Journal. It's used in many gardens uh, around the country. A lot of professional gardeners use this tool. I love this. It's got its own case with it, so you can just put it on your belt and carry it around the garden. That's, that's, nice. that's a good one there. It's a great tool. I use it all the time. Also like in what you've got up here in front. Now, um, a lot of people don't know what that is. and I, Over the last few years, I've kind of realized myself what they are. But uh, tell me, what is, what is this thing? This is a broad fork. Uh, it's uh, a European influence. Uh, and basically what you've got, it's, uh, they call it a U-bar digger. It's another word for it. And it's got two handles, as you can see. And, and basically the way to use it is you put a little weight on it and rock it. It sinks down into the soil, you pull back and cultivate your bed in that way. Once you get going, everything in front of it is loosened and it becomes easier to do. And even in heavy compacted soil, it, you can go about a foot a minute, even in, in really, really hard clay. You can also use it to chop with, to loosen the soil. And what we've discovered is with the use of a broad fork, mm -hmm. uh, as compared to rotary tilling, like with a, with a tiller, is uh, the soil stays friable and uncompacted for a longer time. Might not get as much compaction at the top and things like that using a broad fork. That's right. When you loosen the soil, that whole area inside where the, the fork is loosened stays loose for a considerably longer. Well, for more information about tools, you can contact your local county extension office. And you can talk to your master gardener there and find out what some of their favorite tools are. Well, for From the Ground Up, I'm Chris Mullins. We'll see you next time. Well, our pearl of wisdom this week comes from an anonymous viewer who gives us this advice. The first rule of holes. When you're in one, stop digging. Oh, yeah, farmers, you know that one well. Remember, you can catch our show on demand anytime you want to watch it, even on your smartphone. We currently have more than 100 episodes available at the website virginiafarming.com. That does it for our show this week. Have a great week, everyone. I'm Jeff Ishy for Virginia Farming. And now for your Ag Trivia Question of the Week, the answer when we return. Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they work so hard to establish. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member, and there's a local Farm Bureau in every county. More information is at vafarmbureau.org. Virginia soybean farmers are hard at work growing soybeans to produce products you use every day. Candles, soaps, even crayons can be made from soybeans. Remember, when you buy soy, you're helping to support American jobs, the economy, and our nation's energy security. 
Hi, I'm Jeff Ishy. And I'm Amy Rocher with Virginia Farming. We'd like to invite you to become more involved with the show by submitting your own video reports. If you're involved with a non-commercial organization such as Young Farmers, FFA, a county farm bureau, or perhaps a, a commodity organization associated with Virginia Agriculture, you can submit your own video report to be considered for our program. Video reports should be 60 to 90 seconds and recorded in high definition. It's simple. Just use your smartphone set on 1080p at 30 frames per second. Always, always shoot in the horizontal mode and keep the background noise down if possible. And the file format should be MOV or MP4. And then just send us a link so we can download it here at our studios. It's just that easy. In 60 to 90 seconds, tell us what's going on with your organization and how it relates to Virginia agriculture. Contact us about specific video requirements at our website, virginiafarming.com. We look forward to seeing your video reports on Virginia Farming. And now the answer to your Ag Trivia Question of the Week, D. Virginia-grown peanuts can be eaten roasted, boiled, raw, or any other way you like them.